So, um, to tell you what I do, I have to tell you a little bit about where I've been, um, because it'll make more sense. Um, so when I left school, um, I took up a degree in mechanical engineering, um, and it was a very taxing, very taxing course, but I realised after three years, um, as I was uh, kind of finishing it, that I was more interested in what, how people interacted with technology um, and not really the nuts and bolts of the technology as such. So I was kind of like, okay, that's, that's exactly what I want to do now. I, wanna, I want to understand how people interact with technology, but in order to do that, you have to understand how people actually interact with the world and how they, how they, how they kind of their behaviours and practices dictate who they are and what to do and their motivations and expectations for doing those things. And I hadn't a clue where to start, so I went off and did a little bit of research and I came across anthropology and I was like, okay, this is basically the study of people and cultures and how people interact with the world. And I was kind of like, let's go and do that. So I started my second BA in anthropology and geography. And I went on to do um, an MLIT in medical anthropology where I studied um, the user experience of prosthetic technology. And within that, that project evolved from kind of me hanging out with amputees and their prosthetic limbs every single day, sleeping on their couches and staying in their houses and getting into family rows and stuff with them, um, to actually understanding how we can make person-centered devices and person-centered limbs. Um, so it was like, my question, my basic question was, how can we gather insights about a person's everyday life, all the kind of mundaneity, all the kind of things that they do, from going shopping, from going to the loo, from getting out of bed, just all of these really mundane things, but how can we add that into the design process? And how can we make something more personal for them and therefore more usable? Because if something doesn't fit a person's everyday routines, at the level of the mundane tasks, it is not going to be acceptable or user friendly and ultimately they're not going to use it and have a good experience. And that's really bad for kind of every device that you make for somebody, but particularly stark for somebody who has to wear a limb every single day and they rely on it. So I just became fascinated by all of this by gathering insights, by looking at how people live and then how can we start building things from those insights. And um, I got a job here at University College Dublin then um, with a healthcare technology centre that basically gave me the dream job. <laughs> gave me a job where it was like, okay, Patrick, we want you to go and hang out with um, people who have chronic diseases. We want you to tell us what the, their experience of having that illness is like and then we'll work with the tech and design team to build stuff that's empathetic to their way of life. And that's the, that's the real core thing in my job is that empathy, is, that, is getting to that, these levels of empathy where you can understand um, better uh, what kind of solutions they need. Uh, what is empathy when it comes to, to medi medicine and medical devices? Um, empathy is trying to get a grasp of the person and how they experience their illness beyond the symptoms, okay? So, like, the very kind of crude level of empathy you, could, you, you, might, you might be inclined to think about with somebody who is sick is how did their symptoms affect their physical self? So like say with somebody who has COPD, how, what do exasperations look like? Or, but beyond what's mechanically wrong with them and what, how that affects them, what I'm more interested in is when they're at home sitting on the couch out of the acute setting, out of the hospital, and the door closes and they're on their own, how do they actually go about their daily lives with this illness? So how do they enact and exasperation when they're at home. Like, so things like, so just we'll stick with COPD patients, like they'll have like oxygen tanks around the home and they will have like tubing, of course, that follows them around and follows all over the house. And when I started working with COPD patients, I didn't realize that these are a hazard in the house and it's not really a good design at all. 
But in order to um, in order to realise that, you have to practice the research of gathering this empathy and that's one example of it is how does a person who has COPD who has an oxygen tank attached to them walk from their bedroom to the bathroom um, without tripping over all of this stuff and that helps you to understand their daily lives and the kind of routines and rhythms that they have to go through with this illness that's beyond just the mechanical problem. And, and how, do you, like, how do you then as a designer as an ethnographer how do you actually practice Empathy, like what does it look like? Empathy to me, um, if I was to take a picture of empathy, um, or what I think empathy looks like as I practice it, it would be, um, it would be me right there with the person, um, sitting with them, talking to them, in all of the contexts that they occupy, just like you and I. We, life goes on, you know what I mean? Um, regardless of how sick you are. And... Um, things happen around you and practices happen around you. Some people like, say, some people are immobile, but that means that you have to get an understanding of what independence means to that person. And that's again by being there with them, by seeing who comes in and out of the house, why, what does that person think about, their care about, what do they think about independence? And you start building this picture of this person's life. But you, can, you can't do that if you're not there asking the questions, if you're not there asking, why is this happening? And for me, as a researcher and, um, and working with designers, um, that, that's what empathy should look like. It's your, it's your occupying their life in a certain way. Do you, do you think that um, the medical field is empathetic typically? So, um, yeah, we can get like as practical or as philosophical about that question as you want. Like Western medicine has changed an awful lot in the last 10 years. Like when you listen to the discourses now to talk about holistic medicine and um, kind of understanding the person beyond their illness, just what I spoke about a couple of minutes ago. But in general, it's not, it's practiced in a very rigid way. So say... Um, sometimes now when somebody uh, presents with something maybe in A&E um, and uh, the doctor on call will collect a narrative or collateral as they call it and they try to quickly build a context around what's after happening um, and unfortunately in many cases that is as holistic as it gets you know what I mean and that's nobody's fault, that's the culture. That's a culture, a particular culture of care that has evolved over many, many years in Western medicine. Um, but saying all that, there are certain um, clinicians and healthcare professionals that practice empathy, but they don't call it that. So take public health nurses in Ireland, for instance. They spend their days with um, a, a very, very wide spectrum of people who are ill in the community, from young, from, from working with mums that have just had babies, to uh, the very, very elderly people, so to say, even people who have like moderate to severe Alzheimer's. Like the spectrum is very, very wide. But they will tell you themselves that their most important practice is actually being in the home and the kind of physical, them physically being there and being able to put the arm around the new mum and say it's going to be okay, you're going to get through this, everyone is uneasy and fearful at the start but we're going to be here supporting you through this and for me like working with public health nurses you can actually see that they very much rely on that empathy and building that rapport and trust and creating that belief in their patients that the public health nurse can help them and they need to do that through empathy. Um, it's a bit different, you see, um, in the hospital setting or in acute settings, because a lot of the time it's very reactive. You know, you're reacting to a situation and sometimes you don't have the time and they don't have the resources and it's difficult to actually, you know, build up that level of understanding with somebody because you're literally there to put out the fire. But um, we are certainly moving with chronic disease management and stuff like that. Like we're certainly moving away from that model now where it's more
building understanding what's happening outside the hospital in order to reduce the amount of times people end up in the hospital and I think doctors are starting to become part of that process. Okay. <clears throat> and like, typically when we talk about empathy, we talk about like medical professionals empathizing with patients. Mm. But that's not always the case, right? Like you're designing a system or a program, as you said, when there are faults, they're nobody's fault, they're a culture and organization. Um, and and you know, like, do, you, do you think about empathizing with the uh, practitioners themselves. How do you do that? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, so when a so when a technology is being developed, let's say a patient management system um, in a hospital, um, you have to be aware that that's going to be that's going to impact all of the stakeholders um, within the hospital. And like and to a certain extent the patients will actually be pushed away from this like you know they're not going to be using it they'll more benefit from the efficiencies that it will create in the hospital so in this scenario it's not the patients that you want to get an understanding of it's actually clinical workflows and all of the clinical workflows that are going on say in uh, medicine for the elderly department so you have the doctors and the nurses who will interact most with the management systems and you have to understand then with them, what's the what's their, what's their daily daily what's their day like there, you know? Where do they move? How often do they interact with the current systems? What do they like about it? What do they not like about it? But the kind of real interesting thing is when they when they're all very emo kind of have emotions towards these technologies that are in the hospital, and what you want to grasp is when they say this is say this is really difficult to use or this causes like inefficiencies it's like you want to drill down into what an inefficiency looks like in practice that's what you want to learn and that only comes from spending time with them by being looking over their shoulder and actually seeing the frustrations unfold and then that will really inform me as a person who's gathering insights about what's happening on the ground now in order to inform how um, the next generation of patient management systems could actually work in the hospital. But um, for sure you have to, you also have to work with the clinicians very, very closely because if you don't, if a technology isn't empathetic towards already existing kind of uh, routines and habits and already understood cultures of care and workflow, then it's absolutely not going to fit into their, their workflows or their, their current environment. Like it's just not. So you have to put them front and centre and that's how you do it. It's just being there, understanding what's going on daily. And you can never underestimate the power of daily, the daily life and the mundane tasks that somebody has to do.